this stupid computer. But um, okay, Brooke, do we have a quorum to get started? We do we're just uh, missing CP two? But uh, no one else is here. The independent budget office is here, so our city planning. Okay. Um, let me just. Um, I'm just going to text Debbie to see if uh, one of them are joining on, and then we'll we will get started right away. Okay, you know what, for expediency sake, let's uh, just start and then we can always uh, amend the attendance records and everything else uh, when they uh, join. So um, I'd like to officially call the meeting to order. Uh, as Brooke mentioned, for attendance, all of the board members are present with the exception of Community Board 2. Um, they, never missed so they should probably be logging on and then we can amend the records um i want to welcome the independent budget office and also the department of city planning uh but before that i would like to start the meeting off by saying the pledge please everybody so if we could all just rise and pledge please um i pledge allegiance to the, to flag, the flag of the, of the united, united states of america, states of america. And, and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Okay, um, if I can entertain a motion from the board members to accept the minutes from the May 2024 meeting that Brooke was kind enough to send to everybody. Thanks, Elena. Motion to accept. Okay, and then also Frank Morano. Frank, you were uh, a second, correct? Yeah, I'm a second. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Okay, so um, moving right along, I don't want to keep anybody waiting. Uh, we will go right into the independent budgets office budget office's presentation regarding their analysis of the mayor's executive budget. So uh, you have the floor. Welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Parker and I'm a senior research and strategy officer at New York City's independent budget office. Um, I know that we have spoken with your group before and we love to help just explain what's happening in the city's budget. We are an independent, nonpartisan, um, non-elected city agency that serves to provide information on the city's fiscal and budgetary health. Um, and with that, I would like to share some quick slides and sort of walk through highlights of this executive budget. You should be the presenter. All right. So let's make this big. So today we're going to talk about the executive budget. This came out in April. There were a series of hearings that culminated um, with a final big budget hearing at the end of last month, late May. And so this is sort of the latest financial plan put out by the administration. There are four quarterly budget updates that the city does over the course of its fiscal year. We have one in November. The preliminary budget comes out in January. We have the executive budget, which comes out in April. And this is all leading up to sort of right sizing spending and revenues as the year progresses, but also making a plan and presenting a plan and negotiating with city council to then adopt a budget for when the fiscal year starts. The fiscal year is gonna end June 30th and July 1st, we're gonna start the 2025 fiscal year. So the idea is November tends to be more housekeeping, just fixing up, uh, cleaning up the budget. Preliminary is when the mayor puts out sort of proposals and new ideas. In between preliminary budget and executive budget is when the state budget happens. So that's an opportunity for then any state budgetary changes to be reflected in the city's budget. This year, the state budget and the city's budget were happening at the same time, which made it a little more exciting. 
Um, and so IBO's analysis, we're right now in between this period of, we've now reflected state budget, the mayor has put forth new policies, new programs, new savings, um, and now they're in a negotiation period with council before adopting the budget, which we'll see at the end of June. So that's where we are in sort of the calendar of the city's budget. Sort of big picture, what I have here is this is just showing you where the money in this budget is planned to be spent. So our, our purple bars, these are the expense budget. This is day-to-day -day operations of city government, which is separate from long-term investments in things like infrastructure, schools. Um, those are called capital projects and those are budgeted separately. The city's budget is about $114 billion on an annual basis. The Department of Education is about $32 billion annually, and that's easily the largest of these city agencies. We also have miscellaneous, this is fringe benefits for city employees, social and community services, pensions, and police are sort of the largest of agency expenditures. And we can see that they're, they're sort of a notable size relative to many other agencies in the city's budget. And one thing I'd like to just point out here on the right side in this pie graph is that almost three quarters of the city's budget is with city dollars. Um, and a much smaller extent, 17% is with state money and only 7% of our budget is paid for with federal funds. So largely city funded budget. I'm gonna walk through what this table looks like. It's not scary and you don't have to do any math. Um, we are currently in the final stages of fiscal year 2024. The administration, the mayor's office of management and budget puts out a financial plan. And then the independent budget office, as our name suggests, independently assesses revenues coming in and also expenses that we anticipate. And so then we are able to compare our two budgets. So the mayor's administration is anticipating almost a $4 billion surplus this year, $3.9 billion. Now, IBO, in our assessment of the budget, we, we believe that there is about a billion dollars in change of additional surplus on top of what the mayor has presented, the administration. And so this brings IBO, we are projecting a total surplus in the current year of about $5 billion. Now the question is, the city is required to have a balanced budget. So where does this $5 billion of extra money this year go in order to have a zeroed out balanced budget? They do something, the administration does something called prepayments. So we use any extra money this year to prepay expenses for next year. So the administration is saying there's a $4 billion surplus this year. So they write next year's budget to be exactly the same amount deficit and so the surplus this year zeroes it out. That's how they get to their balanced budget that they're required to have by law. IBO thinks there is a slightly, very tiny additional gap for next year, but then we also had this 1.1 billion that we anticipated in addition to what the administration was already saying was a surplus. And so this means next year, we think there's a surplus using extra money from this year to prepay next year of around 1.1 billion. The long and the short answer of all of this math is that the administration is anticipating a surplus in the current year. IBO thinks there will be a larger surplus in mm -hmm. the current year. And next year we will have a much smaller, but we will still have a surplus. That's it for math, I promise you. We have a team of economists who look at the overall state of the city's health. Um, so here we are showing the number of new jobs created over time from 2024 through 2028. We believe that the number of jobs will be positive, the city will continue to be adding jobs, and that the unemployment rate will fall. The blue section of these bars is representing what portion of those new jobs are made out of healthcare and human services sector. This is largely a very large increase we've seen in the city of home health care aides, um, and that's really driven this sector. There is there is sort of a slowing down in the hiring of that, in part because of a, a tightening labor market. Um, and so we think jobs will continue to grow, but a smaller share of that job growth will be from this healthcare sector.
And then you can't spend money if you don't know how much money you have to spend. So IBO looks at revenue forecasts and each of these, this is 2024 on the left and we have 2025 on the right. The independent budget office estimates are in blue and the administration's estimates are in purple. So over the course of the year from the November plan to the preliminary budget to the executive budget, where we started earlier this year, IBO had a much larger gap in revenue predictions than the administration. And over the course of the year, the administration has brought their estimates up quite a bit, particularly for 2025. And so where we landed at the executive budget, both the administration and IBO have very similar estimates for revenue. I'm gonna to flip to the spending side. So one place where we identified very large savings in the current year, 2024, is city staffing costs. I'm gonna walk you through this graph. So we looked at the average biweekly payroll that the city pays for employees, and the budget has a biweekly payroll of about $2.1 billion. Now, when we ran this, it was through the May 10th paycheck, the city had averaged about $1.9 billion for a biweekly payroll. And this means there's a lot less being spent on city employees than what the budget had suggested. And so there's a very cautious estimate. IBO believes that there's about $800 million of money in the budget for city staffing that we won't be spending. This is in part either positions that eventually got eliminated, but the money was still in the budget, or positions where there was a delay in hiring, and so there was a longer period of time where we weren't paying out a salary. And so this is, this is easily the most notable place in the current fiscal year where we see a budget adjustment in terms of savings. We're gonna talk about, again, city employees. Um, we have our, our uniformed agencies, so police, fire, sanitation, and corrections, and their, their budgets get a lot of attention for the personnel costs and particularly um, overtime costs. We looked at the personnel budgets for these agencies. What is in purple is what is budgeted by the administration, and what in blue is what IBO thinks additionally will be needed. So small amounts in the realm of these rather large agency budgets, um, but in total about 600 million more in staffing costs at uniformed agencies starting in 2025. One thing of note, the fire department we thought was funded about right. So there's no re-estimate for the fire department and small adjustments for police, sanitation, and corrections. There's a lot of numbers on this page. Um, so I'm just gonna go over some highlights. One thing that IBO in looking at city spending particularly has been focused on is the cost of asylum seekers um, and comparing our estimates to the administration. So the, the bottom line with our executive budget analysis is that the independent budget office, we estimate mm -hmm. about $3 billion in less city spending on asylum seekers for 2025 and 2026. And that's $3 billion less than what the administration has in the budget. The biggest driver of this difference is estimates of the population arriving to the city. So the administration has estimated asylum seekers uh, based on what they saw last year, which was a big surge in the summertime. That surge started really in April and May. And this year in April and May, we have not seen that same start to a big surge. So largely our cost difference is due to a difference in population. Um, we kept the actual cost per person or per family of, of services the same as the administration. So the difference, the difference in our estimates is really driven by how many people we anticipate will be arriving and, and staying in New York City and using New York City services. Some of you may have heard of City FAHEPS program. This is a housing voucher program that is through the Human Resources Administration and helps low-income families pay for apartments similar to the federal Section 8 program. The city has been ramping up this program 
And so in 2023, the actual expenditures on it was about $500 million. And this year, the administration has budgeted $785 million, roughly. But then if you look at the purple bars, it sort of drops off in later years. Now, the program is intended to stay at least the same size as where it currently sits, the, in part because people get a voucher for usually a five-year window. So someone who is entering the program in 2024, this spending in 2024, we would expect that spending to carry out over a five-year period. And so what IBO and our re-estimate looks at is if we fund the program at the same level as spending this year, we're going to need more money. And that's what this dark blue on the top of the purple columns represents. So this is a case where future years are under budgeted in the administration's budget. The city council has recently passed legislation to expand the program. And that that is something that we do not include in our price because it's unclear how much between council and the mayoral administration, the negotiations on that expansion will play out. So we, we, for the purposes of our budget reporting, just looked at this as if the current program and its current size continues. We have a big table here. I don't expect you to be able to read these numbers or read all the details. I will tell you that our report is available online and has a lot more discussion about some of these. Um, but what we were looking to do here was to highlight the Department of Education funded a lot of ongoing continuing programs with federal aid that we got in response to the COVID pandemic. So stimulus money from the federal government. And the question is, what do you do with these programs that you plan to continue once the federal money runs out? And this is a place where the budget sort of doesn't have an answer. And so if you assume that programs like special education for pre-k um, mental health staffing there's a lot of early childhood education programs wrapped up in this will continue then it's an expectation that the city will have to pay for this and so there's a sort of very detailed table looking at places where federal funding needs to be needs to be replaced with city funding if the program were to continue Again, there's a lot of text here, so I'm just going to talk through what has been termed a PEG cut, so the program to eliminate the gap. And this is what the Office of Management and Budget uh, puts out, charges agencies, city agencies, with reducing spending, coming up with new revenues, but shrinking their budget. And so this year was a bit of a roller coaster on this front in that November all agencies had to do a 5% cut. This was followed by, at the preliminary budget, they had to do an additional 5% cut. But in the meantime, some of the earlier cuts were restored, other ones remained in place, further cuts were made. And so there's a whole lot of confusion for the public and, and people that we've talked to on what has been cut, what has been restored, what may be restored. Um, Notably, what was restored was the we reinstituted two police academy classes that had previously been taken out of the budget. We also restored funding for the cultural institutions group, which funds a lot of major cultural uh, organizations in the city. Um, but some of the arts and cultural funding elsewhere in the budget has still been still been left at a smaller amount. And then one thing that has been in a lot of the news and a topic that people are talking about, uh, there were cuts made to public libraries and these have yet to be restored. So this is something we're really closely looking at when city council and the mayoral administration do their negotiations leading to adopt the budget. And I have Two last pieces just to close us out, and these are sort of things to be thinking about in the executive budget. One of the new things that the administration did was something called they called climate budgeting. And this is gaining popularity internationally with cities. 
to think about where we're spending dollars relative to climate and, and energy efficiency goals. And so there's a task force within the mayor's office of management and budget that looked at city spending in relation to goals towards net zero emissions, flood resiliency, and extreme heat resiliency. And so they rated city spending as being a line that's helping us achieve the goal of net zero emissions. It's not aligned, so it's actually working opposite of this, this environmental goal. Uh, it is pending, so these yellow bars, which are rather large, which we note, uh, are they didn't have time to rate it yet. So that's something we hope they get better at rating over time. And then in blue, also sort of a large piece of their, their puzzle are what they've called special cases. And this is spending through economic development corporations, the housing development corporation. Um, these government entities, these, these government public benefit corporations that operate a little bit outside of the city budget. And the administration took the stance, we don't have to rate those because it's not direct city dollars, it's city dollars flowing through a separate entity. So this was the very first time they've done this exercise. It's a good start. There's a lot more room to, to be reporting on and to be evaluating. And then just to close us out, so the executive budget included additional capital dollars. This is for construction and large infrastructure projects. Um, the state budget increased the city's ability to borrow long-term debt. And so in response to the changes that Albany made, the executive budget included additional funding for the school construction authority, for the Department of Correction, and then a smidgen for other agencies. Um, the big things that the city was looking to have more debt capacity for was to build more schools in response to the class size. There was recent class size legislation um, that will require more school capacity. Uh, corrections is in the process of building borough-based jails and also not yet in the budget, but sort of at the front of people's minds is also the need to reconstruct the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Well, so yeah. that was the three major reasons the city was looking to expand its ability to do debt service. So with that, that is a whirlwind review of the city's budget. And I am really curious to know what interests you, what you want to talk about, if you have any questions. Um, so I'll few of us on the call, myself included, are already budget directors. A bunch of us wear different titles, uh, you know, wear different hats. So I'm familiar with everything that you said. Um, That's great. I know Frank Rapaciulo also is the council member Borelli's budget director as well. Um, is there anybody here that has any questions for independent budget office that they'd like to be answered? Um, Malik, no? thank okay. you for the uh, links that you put in the chat. I'll print the PDFs of those presentations and include them in the minutes for everyone as well. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Of course. And if you ever do have budget questions, please reach out. One of our okay. one of our our roles is to provide information to council members, borough presidents, elected officials, and the public at large. So please yes, please have, come to us with questions. Been a great resource to us in the past. That's great, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank having you. us here today. Okay, so um, next up is city planning. Can I just ask, though, no disrespect, but everybody on this call has um, seen this presentation numerous times. So can we have a very quick condensed version and then we can do like a Q&A and a comment section because I think that that is really where most people on this call are going are going to really want to you know um use the time yeah Marie that sounds great um we, we did something similar with community board one's land use committee last night because they'd already gotten the presentation twice and they preserved a special meeting just for Q&A 
Um, we do have the presentation, but it's been it's helpful to um, be able to jump back and and forth through. Um, you know, when technical questions come up, we have slides demonstrating technical mm -hmm. responses. Um, I, before we jump into that, I, I just want to say thanks for having us. It is good to be able to have this discussion with you. Um, for I, I guess everyone, it's in some form, it's a continuation of a public discussion. And we certainly acknowledge that we've heard concerns and fears about the need to address uh, our residents' housing crisis through zoning. So today, my colleagues and I are going to give, uh, well, we'll not, we won't give another brief overview. We'll skip the brief overview, um, except uh, to the extent there's initial mm. questions. Um, uh, but I just want to, I do want to uh, probably take some moments to ensure that we're all on the same page about what the proposal actually includes. Uh, but really, we, we agree we want to transition to more of a Q&A and discussion. Um, and, and really importantly, I want to encourage this group to provide specific feedback, some of which I'm sure we'll discuss today, but some of which you may, you may want to you know, discuss among yourselves afterward. Um, but really to, to collect that specific feedback in your formal recommendations. Uh, the department, we came up with a, a worksheet to help members do that. But it, it's certainly up to you together to, to figure out how you want to deliver specific responses to each of the proposed elements of the plan, from town centers to ADUs to parking, because it's that kind of formal specific feedback that that's the tool really that the city planning commission can use to consider changes uh, when they vote on the proposal. And, and we've heard and, and we've certainly seen uh, through the, the recent updates to uh, city of yes for economic opportunity, you know, things like removal of the corner store provision that those really specific elements of feedback can speak to the city council stages too. Um, so I, I uh, think I know everybody on the call, but just to, to make sure uh, we're all squared away with introductions. Uh, I'm Katie Farrar, I am, you know, director of uh, DCB Staten Island office. I'm here with my colleagues, George Shadorovich, deputy director of our office and Amy Obanaga, who's our uh, senior urban design lead uh, and, and also uh, will be, uh, uh, capturing a lot of the um, summary and 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 uh, rehashing of this presentation to you all. I'm sure you've seen both of them work over the last several months and years. Uh, I'm here with other colleagues. I'm um, James Harris uh, from our intergovernmental division, and also Alice Mo Alex Moskowitz, um, who's in our planning support team, but is really an expert in uh, in uh, uh, environmental review and can help speak to any questions that may come up about the EIS in this process. Um, so, with that, I, I, um, you know, George and Amy, you had kind of prepped a longer presentation. So, if there's just a, a moment of squaring away, you want to do before we maybe get to one of the slides um, uh, that, yep. that shows yeah, that the nine good. proposals. Yeah, I think we're good. Amy, can you make it a little bigger? I think maybe um, for some reason the minute. presentation is a little small. Yeah, on my screen it's large, but it's not showing up that way. Hold on. Um, you know, my unusual s screen size. Is it showing up as a present full presentation now? Hey, good evening, Ted. Well, let me in. An update. Oh, no, I didn't. It's, like um, you, it's not in presentation mode. We uh, see all the I'm thumbnails not... on the left. Okay. In mine, it's in presentation I'll mode. Over. I'll step over because I can tell you what I'm seeing in just a moment. Okay. Well, Amy, could you go to slide um, four? Sure. Yeah, let's get going. Yeah, it's so okay. Let's stop sharing. Um, Eating number. One. And I think probably oh, and now it's frozen. That's do escape. So we're seeing this. Okay, so I, I had it stuck on uh, whatever screen you selected to share was just. This box, and so even though you were in presentation yeah. mode, it was just showing. Okay. Background. Are you seeing a full size screen, George? I think you unshare. All right, let's okay. share again. No, not yet. All right, here we go. Yeah. So, so I go to enter screen. No, I'm going to do window. window. Yeah. Hmm. And now, if you do presentation mode, it won't show up. But this is what they see now. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Katie. That's the glory of uh, being in the same office, I guess. <laughs> so, um, we still see the thumb thumbnails on the left for some reason, but we can, we can work with this. Yeah. When I pull um, into so presentation let's... mode, yeah, it doesn't show the, it, it, if I pull into presentation mode, it, it'll, the screen will black totally out again. Fine. Like it... Let's go to slide 3. 
So this is the worksheet that Katie was talking about. Um, we've given it to a lot of the community boards, all three of the community boards already. So make sure to fill that out. Um, as, and as you can see here, um, we just want to acknowledge that this is, this is not a one size fits all proposal. On the next slide that Amy's going to go to, you'll see that there's a lot of different aspects of the proposal. Some apply, Amy, could you, yeah, thank you. Some apply to Manhattan. Can you go to slide four? Some apply to Manhattan, some apply to downtown Brooklyn, some apply to downtown Queens, some apply to St. George. But again, this is not a one size fits all proposal as we have heard uh, from some people. So again, the low density proposals are about missing middle housing. This housing is named missing middle because it is moderate in size, but it's also intended for middle income residents. That includes the town center, the TOD around the SIR stations, and then we also have accessory dwelling units, which uh, we've taken uh, inspiration from other municipalities across the United States that have been doing this. And then you have the middle and high density, which is the orange, which does not apply anywhere in South Richmond. Um, limited, I think there's one spec on the west. You can see the orange dot in Travis. And then St. George, there's a little bit of applicability. Parking, that is citywide. Um, it's one size fits all in, in the sense that there is no more rule. Um, it would be flexible. It would be up to private property owners. Um, that is a one size fits all proposal in the sense that um, it would be a free market choice. Um, there would be no more red tape. And then there's other provisions such as conversion, small and shared apartments and infill. Um, those are limited applicability for Staten Island. Um, somebody had asked us about the shared apartments. Would this allow a home? to then change three bedrooms or four bedrooms at home into an SRO. SROs are single resident occupancy units. Um, the answer to that is no, because um, this is not a rezoning. If you go down one more slide, you'll see the applicability to Staten Island. Um, this is not a rezoning. Um, there have been several rezonings across Staten Island, but this is a text amendment. So there's no zone changes. R1 through R5, you see that blue on the screen? The R1s will stay R1s, the R2s will stay R2s, and the R5s are going to stay R5s and everything in between. Um, so if you have a one family home in a one family district, it can only be a one family home. Yes, we are saying you can add one extra unit for an ADU, but that's only if you have uh, the capability to and if that ADU meets restrictions. So those are the different facets um, of the proposal. And now we'll go into some quick details about them. Uh, Amy, you can go to slide seven and then just read off the quick bullet points for that one. This is the town center proposal. Certainly, so just briefly, like we said, we just will highlight the, the, the facets of the proposal that are more interesting to the, to the borough. So for town center zoning and looking specifically at Staten Island, the areas in red would be the areas, um, do you hear me? Sorry. Sure. These would be the areas where we would look at a proposal for town center zoning. This would be the this would be enabling a kind of development that matches what we've already seen in New York City in low density neighborhoods. Uh, these would be the single story commercial storefronts that are uh, that you see commercial that you see now. These proposals would legalize two to four story buildings in low density districts with currently having commercial overlays. Yeah, and on the next slide, um, you can see some examples like Katie was uh, like Amy was mentioning. Uh, th these exist in a way in New Dorp and Port Richmond already. So again, these are two to four story buildings. Um, but some of these images that you see here, they may be non-compliant today because of all of the uh, regulations that have been imposed since 1961. So again, in these areas in red, the idea is to allow for these businesses and areas to uh, flourish like they once did um, with the historic town centers. So you have along Forest Avenue, Highland Boulevard, um, Richmond Avenue and uh, in the South Shore, little nodes, you have nodes around each, you can see red pockets around each SIR station. So now we'll go to the next one. Uh, and so that's a good this, segue because this one is specifically about um, the SIR stations. Yeah, so yet another for our transit oriented development where this is 
where DCP is proposing a new geography that expands our existing transit zone. Um, previously, we spoke to various electeds and stakeholders who were interested in expanding it. So initially, it was only about halfway through the island, but now this transit-oriented development has been expanded to the full south. This would be uh, it, these would be buildings that would allow three to five stories only if the property complies, and that would be within a half mile of the SIR station of an SIR station over 5,000 square feet in lot area and on a wide or short end of the block. And just to give you a zoomed in and to provide you with some examples um, of, of housing that we've already seen in the history of Staten Island and St. George and Duncan Hills are a couple examples below. Right, and you know, as Katie said, uh, fill out that worksheet because it could be from anything till no housing near the train at all, which, you know, to be very honest, we think is not a sound a rational approach because we need to use the train, but it could be anything from that, no housing at all next to the train to maybe a shorter distance if a half mile is too much. We've heard other numbers being thrown out there. So that's just one example of how to use the worksheet as Katie mentioned earlier. And another proposal we have looking to help homeowners in low density areas would be the accessory dwelling unit, AD, ADU for short. These would be for one and two family homes. And these would be to provide homeowners with a choice to add a backyard cottage, a basement, a garage, apartment, or even an attic conversion. Uh, this would be, we anticipate this being a big benefit for multi-generational families. What we have seen in other areas of the country that have um, enacted these proposals, New Jersey is currently looking to make it statewide actually, is that we have seen, particularly in uh, California, 61% of people who have taken advantage of this program are using it for families. So this would provide um, homeowners an option for their young residents or for older seniors uh, to age in place. And we have four examples of those possible options, which on the upper side you see is a detached, an attached version, a basement or attic version. Uh, as it says on the screen, this would limit the would be limited size for 800 square feet. And it'd be limited to limit stories and height. height. I've got a feedback, sorry. Uh, and, it'd be five, and really, you can be no closer than five feet from an adjacent property and they have to be 10 feet from another building on the site. Yeah, and this was one thing that we did discuss with um, some stakeholders earlier. Um, and, you know, it, it, as Amy said, there are four options. So again, if, if none of the options work for a certain uh, stakeholder or only two of the options, that's something we can look at. Again, uh, the, the size of it. Um, but these, these numbers were taken from several different municipalities across the country, which have been um, letting homeowners improve their property. It, it helps with mortgages. It helps with passive income. It helps uh, an extra uh, place for a family member to live in. And I think uh, when we talked about it with Community Board 1 last night, until 9.30 at night. <laughs> um, the, the number that was thrown out was that 2% of residences actually have the financing. They take the time to get the loan, to get the construction um, drawings drawn up, and only about 2 to 3% across the country have actually done ADUs. But for the people that do do it, it's life-changing. So not everybody can take advantage of it. Not everybody has the either the size requirements um, or they don't have the, the the requirements for the property to do it, but the people that do do it, um, from the stories we've heard across the country, it has been helpful. So, uh, so moving on to um, another another proposal within uh, CHO is helping homeowners district fixes. So this would make um, it possible for zoning for zoning on the ground to actually mimic what you see. So in which case, this would. Uh, allow families to enable a two-family or multi-family building in districts or that already permit them. And below we have an example in Toad Hill of a single-family home uh, in an R12 district. Um, and currently speaking, it would be impossible to span, expand today, but with uh, some of these zoning districts, we'll go into detail in the next slide, it would actually be possible. So this would be addressing the FAR and perimeter, perimeter heights, yards, and other rules to provide flexibility to homeowners. Uh, many older homeowners are uh, older homes are out of compliance, and this would block homeowners from adapting their homes to their current needs. Uh, an additional kitchen, for instance, and it also prevents uh, many families from seeking uh, bank loans to make these uh, adjust adjustments to their homes. And then this next. Um 
slide is a, a real life example. Of, um, somebody had emailed our office saying, um, so an existing homeowner uh, emailed us saying that she wanted to build a new home in their extra side yard. You can see where that tree is in the middle of the two homes. She owns both properties with the red car and where that fence is. And she said in the email, it was her retirement plan when she bought this home in Westerly um, a couple decades ago. But the zoning changes over time, all the um, new regulations that have been imposed, um, it requires her lot to be 3,800 square feet to do anything. And hers is 3,600 square feet. So she's 200 square feet shy. Um, and that, that changed on her as, as she's been living there. So the city of yes, text amendment, these district fixes, as we're calling them, it's slight flexibilities here and there. Um, again, like five feet in height in some areas and uh, 100 to 200 square feet of lot size so that people can improve their homes or use extra yard space that they have. Um, so again, over time, the zoning rules have said, this block right here needs large lots. But as you can see in the picture, none of these homes are that large. Uh, these aren't large lots. It's just kind of that, again, the bureaucracy and all of the layers and regulations that have been imposed over time that have created this situation. So the idea is to allow this homeowner to put a modest size home, which still has yards. It still has a height limit. It, it's, it'll look like these homes, but this is the idea. So we've been getting some emails like this. So this is where this idea came from. So we can stop here for questions on the low density aspect since the next section on high density again uh, is only really St. George and uh, Bay Street. Any questions on low density? Uh, so I, I have a few. So first, um, I just want to state, which I did state previously, and it was acknowledged that um, for some reason at the last CB1 full board meeting and at the CB2 land use meeting, um, I happened to the one time that I don't freaking that I don't go to a meeting because I'm moving my son out of the dorms or whatever, um, that it was stated that the borough president was in favor of some of these proposals, including the accessory dwelling units, which is not accurate. So I just want that on the record that um, that that is that that is not accurate. Um, and I just out of curiosity, this parking um, thing, where on where did that come from? Because I mean, I've sat through this presentation ad nauseum at all of the community board meetings. And, you know, I know um, at CB2, the question kept coming up and it wasn't fully answered or for some reason there was a lack of understanding. And I understand that you are not saying that parking can not be built, it's optional, but I'm just curious, has anybody thought of the fact that if it is optional, it will not be built? Um, I yeah, think we, that if it was okay. something that, let me just finish. I think if it was something that an individual, individual homeowner was undertaking, then that's your home, that's your investment. That, I mean, then you, then that homeowner would put a driveway. But in the case of building, I'm a native Staten Islander. My mom is a native Staten Islander. My mom's dad is a native Staten Islander. And um, so the changes have been like drastic for us. But um, I mean, um, you know, Staten Island has been besieged in the 80s and the 90s with <laughs> builders and stuff like that. And that's what we're worried about. We're worried about these builders coming in because if they can squeeze extra homes in without the parking, you are letting the horses out of the barn door here. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. And um, sorry, you missed the other two meetings for the ADUs. Again, the, um, I said it at the CB3 full board two weeks ago after Marie, after you had said yes. what you just said. And uh, again, as I said a couple weeks ago, we apologize for any misrepresentation or misquotes. Um, we did have meetings with the borough president's office and they um, provided some helpful feedback saying that it is helpful to keep family members and ADUs. Um, but again, we didn't want to paint it as broad support. We know that there's different options and um, 
Anyway, for parking, uh, let's go to slide 20, uh, 28, because you asked, where did this come from? So um, 1,595 US cities have already done this. So this is kind of where it came from. Um, you can see on this map that it's come from a lot of other different towns and cities. Countries too. We have New Zealand, London, Toronto, Canada. So that's where it's come from. All right, well, but Connecticut is your point, Marie. Your point though, is that currently speaking, if a homeowner said, I don't want this, I don't want a driveway, they wouldn't be able to. So this is just simply like, there isn't a maximum being dictated nor a minimum being dictated. This is but just giving a homeowner the chance the to say, I do not want, a, right now a homeowner wouldn't be able to say, I don't want, I don't have a car, I don't want a car. In the case of my grandmother, she didn't have one, didn't want one, but she had this driveway she had to have. This would now give a homeowner an option. Yeah, but the problem is overwhelmingly, you know, like I, like I said, um, without the driveways, it is just going to be, I mean, we already have this problem now when like townhouses and condos were introduced into Staten Island that as it is, there's limited parking because of all the curb cuts that we have on some higher density areas that it is impossible to find parking in certain areas here already. That yeah, just... that's true. Because if you if you require parking on a on a property into the property, upland away, then that requires a curb cut, like you're saying. And you're taking away street parking. Is what you're, that's what you're saying? A lot of curb cuts? Well, if there's a curb cut though, then you but then people can pull into their driveway. Yeah, and they can do that if they want. It's a private property decision. Yes, but like I said, if there's parking not, it's just gonna be and then just and then once again, and the also the intergenerational housing as well. So I currently have an intergenerational home. I grew up in one as well, as did both of my parents, um, as did Every single person that I was friends with growing up had a grandparent living in their house. So we've, so, and once again, like I stated, I'm a native Staten Islander, so is my mom, so, uh, so are, is my mom's dad. And we've had intergenerational families living together. Like I said, I don't know anything different from that, quite honestly, in my life. I'm like certain some other people too would know that. Like I said, I have an additional, additional person living in my house right now. When I was growing up, my grandmother, um, you know, and both my parents had, my mom had her grandfather living in the house. My dad had his grandmother living in the house. So I'm just curious, okay, like, yeah. why the need for the About change? About the ADUs, this, going back yeah, to the ADUs. Why the need for the change when this already exists? And this, that's like, I mean, I don't know if any of you are native Staten Islanders, but that's I, just a, I am. just something that is Staten Island. And yeah, I am, and I are very family oriented. So I, I did grow up on Staten Island, and my we did have an intergenerational family. But what I would say is that my the home I grew up in preceded 1961 construction. So we were grandfathered in so that I had multiple kitchens. So my mom had her own kitchen. My grandparents had their own kitchen, and we were comfortable. As it stands now, for you to build that home with multiple kitchens, in many cases, would not be permitted. Yeah, so I mean, the idea for ADUs, um, like I've said, we don't have a map for ADUs, but that's also been implemented across um, the country. And and it, it's, again, it's just an idea. If, if, if someone would like to add a backyard cottage, uh, this has been done across the country. If anybody would like to add an attic unit, um, you know, a, a staircase on the side, so someone can uh, add a unit above. We've heard, and there's been data that shows it helps people with their mortgages, it's a passive income. It helps middle class people. It unlocks new potential for your private property. But again, for the parking, we uh, just to end on parking. Parking is the big one. Um, again, this council member from Norman, Norman, Oklahoma. He said that it was a great decision. Got rid of the red tape. Um, and if you go down, we don't have to keep talking about the rest of the country because I know we keep talking about native Staten Island, Staten Island. Go down a couple slides, Amy. Uh, this was from. Um, a woman who owned this home in um, Tompkinsville. She's never had a car. She, um, she said she doesn't need a car. Um, 
her house doesn't have any parking. She knew that when she bought it. She does have um, space to add another unit. She wanted to expand her home. When she went to DOB, DOB said, if you do any improvement, the zoning code says you need three parking spaces to do this. She mm -hmm. said, I can't fit three parking spaces on my property. Um, and they said, well, then you can't do anything with your, you can't improve it as you want to. So this was somebody that emailed us and said, what can I do? And we said, currently nothing. But if, if, uh, if this proposal that we're proposing now goes through, then you'd have flexibility with your private property to do, to do what you want with your private property. So I, I think we totally understand that it sounds like Maria, you agree, private property owners should be able to do, it's a private property, right? But there's also this criticism of developers coming in and maybe building homes with a bunch of units and there's no parking. And then the question is, if people buy those units, where are they gonna park? Um, I think park. Alex, Alex uh, or Katie may be able to speak to this more, but um, you know, research has shown that even in other places of the city, some developers are providing more parking than the zoning says. It's really market demand. And I know some people may not like that answer, but developers um, tend on, on the larger scale to provide parking for families that need it. And if a family is looking at a home that has zero parking spaces, it's, it's doubtful that a family with three kids would buy that home. But again, um, this is just trying to get the red tape out of the way. But if, if any of my other colleagues wants to add to this uh, or has any other, um, can you go to slide 29? If there's any other um, insights from the other 1,500 other towns that have done this, you can the, see the where we went. Thing is, I'd actually just uh, uh, kind of keep it local for a second and, and just note that um, we do, uh, you know, in addition to getting these kinds of questions and concerns uh, about home from homeowners who want to expand their home or, or legalize a second unit in their home uh, and are constrained by parking requirements, we do, of course, also talk to developers um, that are prospective, uh, you know, looking at looking at lots that they could turn into more units. Uh, and uh, we, we do, uh, you know, a, a approach the question of, of how much parking are you planning to provide? There's there's waivers through certain zoning actions, um, different zoning districts require different amounts, and, and pretty consistently, um, you know, in all except the closest locations to the ferry, uh, we we do get the feedback, and you do see, you know, through our our dealer applications, parking continuing to be provided even at a number higher than than what's required, um, recognizing that that is that's that's a need here, and that's going to help sell their their prop their their development. Um, so we do see that, and, and across the city, we have examples of, of parking being provided at, at a higher level than the required amount, especially when it's in some of those higher density districts that require fewer parking per unit. Okay, um, I don't want to take up any more time. I want to give uh, my colleagues the opportunity to, um, you know, ask questions and make comments. So um, we have two uh, hand raises from uh, Frank and Frank, and then also a question from Elena in the chat. Okay. Take it away, Brooke, who was ever first in line. Go ahead. Um, Frank? Victoria, Frank Moreno or right Frank Rapachula, one of the two of us. You both have your hands up, so yep. you, you, yeah, you go, go first. Go, go first, Frank. You had your hand up first. All right. Thank you, Frankie. A um, few points, okay? One, you show a lot of these houses and everything that people have these problems and they can't do it. When they come in front of the community boards with us, we do give them flexibility most of the time. It's very rare that we don't give it to them, okay? So they do have the opportunities to do what they want to do. It's not so cut and dry as you're making it out to be. The second point I'd like, and the point I'd like to ask, on the ADUs, somebody in a one or a, a, a um, R31 or an R3, Excuse me, an R1 or an R2 zoning. Would they be, would they be able to put in an ADU? R1 and R2. Yeah. Yeah. As it currently, um, as it currently is proposed, but we've heard from other people that maybe certain districts are more appropriate than others. So. Sure. You so can tell words, us if you George. think an R3 or R1 or R2 is more appropriate than another. Okay. So, George, basically, in that case, if you allow that, you have just destroyed all R1 and all R2 districts, which means that effectively you have changed the zoning. You might not change it on paper, but in actuality, you did. Okay. I want to make that point. Another point I'd like to bring out is, you know, I'm a native Brooklynite. I grew up in Brooklyn, and I grew up in a multifamily, a multi um 
excuse me, a multi-generational house in Brooklyn. And I remember, you know, and it's the way it is today, you know, people looking for parking spaces all over the place because they weren't parking people going up and down the blocks where they could be. And we'd be playing as a kid, we'd be playing ball in the street and there were cars lined up on both sides. We'd be playing stickball, we'd be playing football, and sometimes we'd hit a car, we'd do some damage, and then we were taken off and we were gone. So I don't want that situation to be in Staten Island because that's the way it was when I grew up in Brooklyn, and that's what you would be, cre would be creating. Parking is a must. People, we are a car society, whether we want to say it or not. People must have parking at place to put their cars. If you go to Europe, I've been to a number of European cities, I see cars parked all over the sidewalks and everything on the inner cities. And that's not something that we want because people will put their cars someplace. Okay. Um, along the train station, you want to create this mile from each, excuse me, half a mile from the train stations. To go and even the chart that you showed, basically, you'd be creating a strip from Clifton to Tottenville, right down the whole community board, the heart of community boards two and three, allowing basically getting rid of the zoning. That's what Agreed. you'd basically be doing, okay? And it would be gone. So, I could see allowing a little bit, you know, way back when we did down zoning back in the 90s in Eltonville, we did a lot of down zoning, the Eltonville Homeowners and Civic Association. And we did it, we worked with city planning, and they said they wanted to leave a strip along uh, the railroad at the higher zoning. Higher zoning, I'm talking about R32, which allows townhouses and garden apartments, okay? And we said, okay, but they said a block north and a block south, not a half a mile north and a half a mile south. No, that wasn't the case. You're creating a wide, a wire, a mile wide strip right across the whole from Clifton, like I said, to Tottenville, where the zoning is gone. Okay, that's what you're doing effectively. All right. And you must have parking. A builder once said to me, and I already said this once, if you have enough parking, you don't have enough building. Okay, and that's what was said. So to, for us to say in Community Board 3, we, we are vehemently opposed to this plan. We've seen some improvements, okay, in that you're not allowing stores in the commercial part to be built on corners, and you're not allowing the people to, you change, you're not changing the rules as far as businesses in store, in, in um, residential neighborhoods. That Those are two good, big, excuse me, good improvements, but a lot has to be done on this residential part, especially the parking. I, I hear you, Frank, and, and you know, it's just a, a moment to say that that those improvements have been done, um, you know, with with this kind of specific feedback. So, like as George said earlier, um, the um, the kind of geographic applicability of TOD is absolutely something we want uh, for our board, community boards, uh, electeds to to weigh in on to refine the proposal for Staten Island. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Finished. Yeah, he went from Frankie. Frank, Frank, okay, you Frank Rapachulo. All right, we'll switch it over. Thank you for the time, guys. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate, like I've said in the past, uh, like the council member has said in the past, ADUs totally against them. Um, also, the like Frank said, you know, the the current distance near the train um, basically now shows. I'm glad you made the rep because we've been talking about it, um, and it was kind of what I was thinking where it would just be like this now snake that's going to run right through the middle of the island there. Well, the southern part of the island, um, and you know, it's it's just it's too big at that, that half a mile, certainly. Um, George, you actually did answer part of the question I was going to ask as far as how does how do people access the the accessory dwelling units when they're it's like an attic and stuff like that. The other part of that question I had is how how does the homeowner block access to the interior of the home? What hap what happens there? And I'm just curious one for for safety and two. Um, just out of curiosity for like fire department and things of that nature. Also, how the for the you know the detached ones in say a garage or whatever else we're calling them. Um, how does the plumbing work with that as far as impact? You know the added impact now to to the sewer system and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, great great question. Um, so, how would it be blocked? I think you said right, Frank. I didn't hear. I'm sorry. You cut out. Did you say how would it? How would the homeowner 
block access or yeah so like if let's say so like yeah. i have my house that i have now right i have an attic basically that i can stand up and walk around it. my my one of my neighbors he converted it to like two bedrooms and a bathroom and that's like mm -hmm. the way he lives in his house i don't know how he did it i never looked it up but whatever um yeah so uh, but it's not for anybody else it's just for him and his wife and his kids so i i, can, I know how that would work but like if i was to block it off from my house what would I be required to do or not or not allowed to do as far as like closing off interior access, um, you know, to that unit? And then because I, I was also curious how you would get to it, but seeing scaffolding or, you know, uh, other some kind of a metal stair giant metal staircase outside homes, I think is also something that we don't want to see just aesthetically. But uh, but now I'm just kind of curious on the fire department end of things for, you know, if they enter. If they enter the house and think that they're going to go upstairs, now they got to come back out and then go back up the stairs, or how you know how do right. they how do how do they approach that? Well, th there would be um, separate um, separate access and egress uh, for for these types of units. Um, they would have to meet FDNY code, uh, DOB code, and Amy, do, you might have more. Um, yeah, I was going to say so. Given that, I think they would need like a separate fire rating. Or a party wall, as they call it, because it's it would be another unit. Yeah. So the agency, I, I didn't have a chance to get in this detail, but for those of you who this is new to, the the agency put together an in, interagency group which met regularly, and um, that was FDNY, DOB, DEP, um, HPD. A number of agencies came together to make sure that there are state and other city rules, and there are building codes that have to be maintained in order for you to build this facility. Or, or to convert your garage. And what we are trying to emphasize also is that out of the four options, you will only get one for a two, two family home, or one or two family. Um, and out of those, three of those options are already in your home and they will have to meet all building codes and DOB regulations. And this would be a homeowner's um, choice as to how they decide to, to separate that unit if they decide that they want to, because it's, it will be their yard, it will be their home, right? Yeah, and it may not be financially feasible for everyone. Um, but, you know, as we've seen from other places in the country, everybody doesn't do it, but the people that do do it, it helps them and it helps them create some passive income financially. Um, I get that. So, it helps them out. Yes, yeah, so certainly in the case of like New Jersey, where they've done it township by township, right. and I think the, they're currently looking to make it statewide. Um, Princeton, New Jersey, um, has had it uh, ADU since 2020, and they've received 38 applications since 2020. 38. I get, I get, I get the reasoning behind it. Right? My, as a, for instance, my friend has a two million dollar house. I have a five hundred thousand dollar house. He has a two family, and it has a you know it's a two bedroom unit. So he gets a considerable amount of rent. Plus, he's close to public transportation. Um, people have they're older couples, so they have a car anyway. But um, so, but his mortgage. My point is, his mortgage is actually the same price as mine, and he has. You know, twice as big of a lot, twice as big of a house. So I get, I get the financial part. I, I get it. However, he bought a two-family house because of that. I chose not to buy a two-family house because working where I work and some of my colleagues here, nobody ever calls and says, "Oh my God, I have the best tenant." All they call and say, "I have the worst tenant. How do I get rid of my tenant? My tenant's selling drugs out of my house, beating people, and they, any number of crazy things that come in." So I chose not to have a two-family. But if I wanted it, I would have just bought a two family. So my point is, we already have two family homes. I don't see why we have to now make one family homes convert to two family homes. And to be quite honest, I'm not totally convinced on the safety matter of because if I was to put a unit in my attic, the first thing I'm going to do is put a lockably locking steel door at the bottom of the staircase to my attic to make sure whoever whoever is in my apartment now doesn't get into my house. And now when the fire department comes in, they're going to be met. In a fire with a steel door that they're not getting through. So I, I would like to just see anything that the fire department has on record. If you're saying it already exists that of how, how they're going to enforce these rules. And make sure that, you know, their safety is, 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 you know, is of the utmost importance and to something that uh, Frank Morano had said at a, at a past uh, community board meeting. Where we were discussing solar panels and things like that on the roof. And it was clear that the gentleman that was there was basically just saying what he was told and not what he truly believed as a fireman. Whereas he, was, he kind of was talking about how they're going to be extending the space where you can put solar panels and, and not as much need for a fire department access to on roof cuts and all these other things, which is contrary to basically every firefighter principle out there. And any fireman will tell you that. 
um, it's venting a roof is extremely important. So now, if we're going to el eliminate that in the auspices, oh no, you don't really need it. Whereas it's truly just because we want to add more solar solar space. Um, my my point to that is that I I, I want to make sure that the reasons being given are are truthful and that and not to say anybody here is lying. I would just like to see them, um, and just to make sure that it's not you know it's being done for safety and not being done so that this can happen in lieu of safety. That's that would be my only point. No, no, that's a great point, and we can find the specifics, but uh, so we can actually point to it. But we we definitely want to point to something to show you for sure. But from what what we know, yeah, you I mean, need a separate even if it goes through, eventually you're going to have to like tell somebody how to do it, right? So everybody's going to have to need to know. Architects going to need to be in the know. Um, my last point that I would end off with was just that you guys ref always reference that so many other cities have done this, um, even though people are opposed to it, but. Uh, just as a, for instance, today, we saw something that that a lot of other cities have done that failed miserably in other cities and was quite close to happening here. And hopefully the, you know, the, the city will follow the, the governor's kind of move today with eliminating at the last minute this proposal for congestion pricing. And hopefully this kind of follows suit, whereas just because other cities did it and maybe it worked there and most likely it didn't, that we should be doing it also. So I would just, that's how I would end it. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, and if that's, I could that's a, great, add... that's a great international reference. It's not in America yet, but and it maybe sure, it won't sure. be. <laughs> um, just one other question that I have too. Um, so now what about the areas that do not have sewers that already have overtaxed infrastructure? So I'm gonna throw it out there because you used it as an example. Toad Hill. There is so much of Toad Hill that does not have sewers, they have septic. So when we come and then we're going to be adding these additional things, it's already overtaxed as it is during major uh, storms and stuff like that. These people in their um, these people get sewage in their thing. The same thing with um, Lighthouse Hill, some parts of Dongan Hills Colony, and everything like that. I mean, so um, you know, like Frank said, you'll essentially be changing the zoning without actually changing it. But in addition to that, these places don't have, don't have sewers. They're on septics. And actually there's even a small area that has cesspools. Yeah. Well, specifically Toad Hill, um, is a special district and that goes through review no matter what, um, that has city planning review. So. We say here at city planning, if you put a shovel in the ground in, in SNAD and SNAD is special. Amy, can you go to the I know slide? It is. Oh, okay. So if you put a shovel in the ground in SNAD, then you need um, a review. So if you take a tree out, you know, if you do anything, so you need some sort yeah. of review. That still doesn't answer your question about septic uh, and dry wells, but in those areas, if you can't prove that you have the 10,000 square feet for septic for multiple units, uh, DOB won't um, allow that. This is in, in SNAD or outside of SNAD. Um, I know a lot of properties on the East Shore also just run on septic and in the South East Shore. So you would need to prove to um, DOB that you have dry wells, that you have a, a leach field and a septic tank um, to get your permit. And regarding okay, now what about DEP, oh, sorry, um, there have been done. hundreds, sorry, and regarding DEP, there have been hundreds of units for projects such as Cole Street um, and another project that you will all probably be uh, hearing about soon. You just reviewed Princess Point. Uh, DEP is putting a moratorium, uh, essentially. They're not allowing developments of any homes due to infrastructure issues. So the city already reviews infrastructure issues due to MS4 requirements. Uh, I know that the council member's office has been called frequently about this MS4 issue, but the city doesn't allow homes to be built if, um, if there's not adequate infrastructure. And I know that there is already some infrastructure that needs to be upgraded because homes, older homes have been there for so long. But since older homes have some issues with flooding and we hear about flooding issues across the island, that's why some of these bigger projects, like Cole Street that the board reviewed, um, it, it can't build until it proves to DEP and to the city that they have adequate infrastructure. So that, that's one answer about septic, dry wells, and infrastructure. 
So now on the point of dry wells, though. Everybody knows dry wells have a limited shelf life. So while it's being built, the home is being built in the beginning, it may meet the perk test and everything else. But however, as time goes on and dirt and silt and everything gets into those dry wells, we have seen this numerous times. We've seen it in Midland Beach. We've seen it in, I mean, I, you know, before I worked for the borough president, I worked for uh, borough president Otto and I worked for him as a council member and I worked for council member Fusco before that. And, you know, we've seen this where like in Midland Beach, homes were approved because they have dry wells, but those dry wells are no longer working. And then we have streets that are completely underwater after a rainstorm. Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. Properties are I mean, it's, it's really terrible. And we, and again, we, you know, I don't think uh, planning in general approves or supports uh, sprawl or anything that requires dry wells. That's why we heard from Community Board 3 for years in the Community Board Statement of Needs, they said abolish private roads, abolish private roads. And we worked with Frank and Charlene and Tom and private roads. Uh, the BSA does not give out GCL 36 waivers as often as they used to, like candy. You have I'm to map it. And you have to work with my the previous boss. So, so we don't, you know, we've, we've worked to resolve that. And now this proposal, this proposal tries to uh, look at infrastructure next to existing uh, housing next to existing infrastructure. So this focuses on town centers that already do have sanitary and stormwater. So. I, I think we agree with you, Marie, that we don't want to keep perpetuating dry wells. We want to put housing where there is already infrastructure in the town center proposal. Can, can you go back, Amy? Go back to where we're, we're focusing on infrastructure. We're, we're doing town centers. There's already sanitary and sewer. And also around the SIR, the SIR has infrastructure. Let's use it. We're, 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 we're not using it like we should. So again, agreed. We should not keep sprawling. We accomplished that with CB3. No more private roads. That needs so much capital costs. You have to put in new roads, new lights, new fire hydrants. It's a lot. So I think I, we totally agree with you on this, Marie. Okay. Any other board members have any comments? It Elena, was, was your question answered? Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, George put details in the uh, chat for you. Okay. I'll include that in the minutes as well. Okay. Fred, you have something? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm listening. to modify their house whether it be these Fred you broke up can you restate and start over again yeah I hope you can hear me well yes modifying some of the houses whether it be the attic basement or whatever a sprinkler system is going to be uh, need to be added to these houses that do not already have one did anybody else hear the question yeah I, I, I didn't hear the whole question so sorry uh -huh. Marie, did you hear the question? I only caught the tail end of it. Yeah, so did I. Fred, can you restate your question? I don't know what's going on. You're coming in, you're coming in and you're not, and then it's coming out very loud at the end. Sorry. I have, I have headphones in, so I think I heard him a little bit more clearly. I think mm -hmm. his question basically was whether or not it would be required for sprinklers in the oh, attic. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes, the, the build that, that's within building code. And, you know, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are not changing. That requirement that would still be a requirement um, for any. You're still required to meet requirement. building codes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Thank you city planning for coming in for answering our questions. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the board members for participating. Um, so, as you know, we don't meet over the summer unless there is a major issue that needs to be voted on. Mm -hmm. So this could potentially be our last meeting until September. So um, I just want everybody to enjoy their summer. If we do not meet, I know I will speak to all of you regarding different matters, just not in this forum. Um, okay, so moving 
right along to uh, official board business. We did not have any correspondence uh, this month. Does anybody have any old business to bring up? Does anybody have any new business to bring up? Can I entertain a motion to adjourn, please? Fred no, first. Sure. And can we have Abby's a second, up. please? Abby, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Take care, guys. Have a happy All day. All right, take summer. care. Nice thank seeing you. you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone.